You're live. Yep, thank you. Hi everyone, it is it is Dr. Romney. I was getting a pen. Um, I hope everyone is having a good day. I had a sort of a discombobulating last hour, so I'm gonna try to uncombobulate, I guess. And um, again, it's Friday night and a little bit of a little bit of live action here. I had I have been sitting through lectures on trauma all day. So that's a that was sort of it's it's been heavy, but there's a lot that I learned there. I'm always trying to learn more to be able to speak more about um, narcissistic relationships, how they affect people, how people can heal. I want to share one thing in particular I heard that I thought bore sharing here. And um, I'm going to also encourage everyone questions once again. So please do as I'm speaking, you might have questions, you might already have them, you can tee them up, but I'll be doing those in sort of the latter part of this program. We I have about so many topics here. It's almost like, I know I definitely won't get to all of them tonight. I might even, I will still ask for, I still will ask for ideas for tomorrow, but um, I'm just going to take all I'm going to get to get through all of these. And, um, and as you know, part of the lives is still part of that campaign of the, you know, the book is still, if you will, is persisting on the list, which I've shared with many I've spoken to today. It's its own surprise. And I'm a woman, woman of my word. And I said, as long as that's happening, we're going to continue having the lives. And we're also going to continue having the promotions. And so what that means is today and uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, Saturday, today's Friday, tomorrow, Saturday, until midnight in whatever time zone you're in, if you order either the ebook or the hard copy of the book, and you fill out, we have a pre-verification link that you can do it. It's either in our Instagram, but we usually have a graphic. So I'm going to try to explain this in the sort of clunky way I'm doing it. Um, you can either, um, you can verify it on either, um, the, the link to verify it is either in the Instagram bio or it's in the video notes. And it will be a, um, you will get a six hour live virtual retreat. And some people are saying, I'm just hearing about this book which is fine. I don't know why you, I mean, some of you have heard about it, some of you not. We were talking about it more and more. So more of the word is getting out. You might have even seen it on someone else's feed or a post from someone else. And some of you are saying, oh, are you still giving some of the giveaways? We are probably our biggest one, which is the six hour live virtual retreat. Um, and that you can still get that's happening in May. So it's it's live, it's, it, it's virtual. Um, but if you can't make it the day we do it, you can still watch it as a recording afterwards. Um, so you will get that for free. Once the book is not doing its whole listy thing, then we'll just, you know, that, that won't, they, we won't be doing these anymore. And also we continue to do our raffles. Um, the Tea with Dr. Romani, those conversations with me by Zoom, private conversation with me by Zoom, you could win, as well as signed books, book boxes, and other prizes. Each time you buy a book, the book acts basically as a raffle ticket. So if you're new and you haven't done it, there's your raffle ticket. If you already ordered it, you stay on the raffle list. Don't worry, your name's not going anywhere. And if you want more chances to do it, just go ahead and order more. If you want to give away some for gifts, this is the time to do that. And um, it is, the book is, I believe, still 30% off on Amazon. So it's not that expensive. So that's how that works. And again, I will be answering questions at the end. So let's sort of take it from, let's sort of take it from the top. Okay. So one of there's so many interesting things. I don't worry. I haven't forgotten you, INFJ person. When I answer that question, I have. I'm going to notes on my phone. Remember, I told you someone I work with, Irene, is a real. She knows a lot about the Myers Briggs. She sent me some detailed notes, which I studied last night. But I want to look at those notes, and I don't want to break out of this. So I'll do that right before I go to questions. A question that came up when you, I was asking for topics two days ago and yesterday was this idea of two narcissistic people. And there's sort of two ways that this, this topic was requested. What if you have two narcissistic parents? In fact, I met a couple of people today who did. And what if just two narcissistic people get into a relationship? I'll answer the second part of that first because it's the easier part to answer. The question people had is, does this even happen? It happens all the time. You can completely understand how a narcissistic person would be attracted to another narcissistic person. So two narcissistic people are going to come together. They're going to be attracted to all the love bomby stuff, the charm, the charisma. Now you got two charming and charismatic, attractive, potentially people coming together. So you can see how they're attracted to each other's sort of pizzazz, as it were. And what that means is because they are attracted to each other and they get into a relationship, it's often very volatile. It's, it's almost like a disaster. It is, it is loud. There's often 
betrayal and lying and and lots of strong emotion. And like I said, lots and lots of volatility. Two people gaslighting each other. And the thing is, within a narcissistic, two narcissistic people in a relationship, nobody backs down. So it's just, it's constant battling. Now, if it was just the two of them, I'd almost say, let them go do their thing. Now that there's two people that nobody else is dating, it isn't that grand. The problem is if they stay together and go on to have kids, those kids are in a rough spot. So now let's talk about the kids of a double narcissistic situations. This is terrible. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. it's terrible because no one is attuned to the child because at least if you have a narcissistic parent and a non-narcissistic parent, and that non-narcissistic parent is fine as a parent. I mean, we actually have a video coming out about sort of how it can actually be quite rough though. If your non-narcissistic parent still might be quite preoccupied with dealing with the mess of having a narcissistic spouse, especially if they still don't know what it is, right? So you'll have the situation where you may actually be securely attached to your non-narcissistic parent and it's fine, but they still are going to often be distracted by the narcissistic parent. So there's going to still be that experience of even your healthy parent can't always be there. But when you have two narcissistic parents, you have a child who's often not able to attach successfully or securely to either of them because they're both kind of doing their own thing. You're, that's a child that's growing up in the midst of that volatility. It's a child that's often used as a human shield and commandeered in arguments between the two of them. It is a per, it's it's a it's a child who's often just feels like I don't even know who the ally is. Probably one of the narcissistic parents may be more mildly narcissistic than the other, and so that might be the one safe port in the storm, but not that safe. There's no place for that child to get validation. The, the child's needs are pretty much almost ignored or selectively chosen when one narcissistic par parent, one parent is trying to stick it to the other parent, like trying to almost out parent them. And so now the child is like a prop. There is shaming. The child is told that their feelings and thoughts and all the usual stuff is sh are shameful, but that might be happening on both fronts. And the child may be incredibly anxious and hypervigilant at living in that kind of volatility. And it can almost feel at any time people are going to leave. And odds are when there's two narcissistic people, parents, it's not going to last a long time. Someone's going to leave. And then obviously the abandonment issues. So it's kind of a disaster, frankly, when children are involved. If two narcissistic people want to get together and they're sort of consenting adults, that's on them. But when there's children involved, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. And, and then in, in the kind of work that has to be done in therapy is to really help a person will often have attachment issues after coming out of that and doing very attachment focused work creating greater safety around relationships. That would very much be the focus of somebody who grew up in that way. It's also conceivable that if there are two narcissistic parents and it blows up, right? Narcissistic people don't do a well alone as a result. So either one or both parents may have rather quickly gotten into new relationships. And there's a decent probability that one of them may have also chosen a narcissistic person. So now you might have a narcissistic step parent in the mix too. So any of you who have been through this, and I'm sure some of you have, it was it was just epic and it was awful. And it's it's just terrible because the the child only is getting consideration when it's convenient, when the child can be weaponized, when the child can be commandeered. And, and it, it, you just, you, again, it's a hypervigilance that will usually persist for a person into adulthood. Lots of abandonment stuff, lots of anxious attachment stuff. All of that stuff is going to be there when you have sort of that double narcissist situation. Another question we got here, and I'm kind of going back between these two, um, these two kinds of lists of, of things here, is around financial and economic abuse. Now, somebody also asked about coercive control, and I'm going to bring those two pieces together, all right? So coercive control is a, it's a form of emotional abuse in a relationship, but by definition, there's never the requirement of physical abuse when there's coercive control. It's, and in fact, by definition, coercive control in and of itself doesn't, it doesn't have physical abuse in it. Person quite often may be experiencing a coercively controlling relationship that also has physical abuse, but they're not like one is not, a, it, it, they don't go together. They're not, they're not a requirement requirement for each other. Right? So, 
we're talking about a pattern of emotional abuse and control where a, a person in a relationship is kept in place by fear and menace. And this is done through isolation, financial abuse, absolute control over comings and goings. Um, people are often uh, leave employment situations so they'll never be out of the purview of the coercive controller and will not have financial resources. Coercive controllers will do things like threaten to harm children, threaten to harm pets, might wave a firearm around, but won't shoot it or anything like that, but say, hey, I've got this. So I started saying there's always this menace of violence that's lurking but it, it may not ever be actually eventuated. It's just that the sense that if you make one wrong move, it'll happen. People who are in coercively controlled relationships are always isolated. The coercive controller will have cut off all relationships. The person often can't come and go. There might be surveillance systems on the houses like alarms and cameras. There might be, um, they might have a tracker on their phone, tracker on the car, if they even have access to a car, may not have access to their own fi um, fi finances. Um, be on an, at best at an allowance. But again, the comings and goings are very, very carefully tracked. In coercively controlled relationships, it's also not unusual for there to be tremendous suspiciousness and even jealousy. So if, if a person even went into the grocery store with a coercively controlled uh, partner and they say something like, thank you to the to check stand cashier person, the it, it easily could escalate with a coercive controller screaming, why did you have to talk to that person? Why are you flirting with them? And then call them all kinds of terrible names. A coercive controller will tell a person when and how to eat, how much to eat, um, when to sleep, uh, how to dress, whether or not to wear makeup. All of that is part of what we see in coercive control. It is incredibly harmful. People who experience coercive control will often experience complex trauma, especially if it's lasted for a long time. Now, just because a person, and so that's a whole severe sequelae. Most coercive controllers are either sociopathic, psychopathic, or narcissistic. We haven't really seen a variation where that's not the case. Three states in the United States, Connecticut, California, and Hawaii, have coercive control laws in their family, in their family law. So it can be called upon as part of um, family law deliberation. The UK and Australia have criminalized aspects of coercive control. So it's part of the conversation. It will likely never get criminalized in the United States. And in fact, I was reading some articles about this legislation and some of the pushback was that you can't, um, what was I saying? You can't mandate people being nice. I was like, "Ooh, that's a stretch." That they don't think that the that the absence of coercive control makes someone nice, but okay. But I don't think it'll ever hit the criminal uh, the criminal statutes in the United States. It'll never hit that. But like I said, Australia and um, and the UK, United Kingdom, and it's, it's almost always occurring in an intimate relationship, right? So in a, in a couple partner relationship. I could see it happening in other relationships, but that tends to be how it's defined, right? It is very, very, very harmful. We tend to see it in much, 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 much more severe narcissistic abuse with much more severe presentations of, like I said, psychopathy, sociopathy, malignant narcissism, that sort of thing. That's coercive control. Now, financial and economic abuse are always a part of coercive control, but they can happen in narcissistic relationships, even in the absence of coercive control. What can that look like? It can be mixed messages around money. Go ahead, spend the money, and then be shamed afterwards if you did spend the money. You'd see, like, you'll see that a, a narcissistic person can be ridiculously miserly about money in some areas, and then do something like, I don't know, like spend a ridiculous amount of money on like a new jacket, right? But they were they were obsessing over the generic sugar to buy in the grocery store kind of thing. So there'll be this very mixed messages, but ultimately there's a tremendous entitlement. Money is a funny thing for narcissistic people because it's such a source of power and control. And as a result, they're wonky about it with other people. Narcissistic people want to be generous, like pick up the check and do things like that. They expect to be validated when they do it, but then they're bitter after they do it. Oh, these people all take such advantage of me, but you're the one who offered. So they'll, they'll be this, again, these really mixed, confusing messages. And over time, people find themselves more and more tense about the money conversation. But by and large, narcissistic folks use money to control. And so they will tell a partner 
stop working and then they'll complain some months or years later, you don't contribute to the household. So it's, again, it's, it's a lot of um, inconsistency and people also feeling as though they are, it's what keeps them stuck. And that's why it's so tricky with narcissistic relationships. I have to say, if I were to rank order, and this is just sort of me spitballing here, if I were to rank order the reasons people get stuck in these relationships, second after only trauma bonding would be money. Because I've worked with many people who said, if I had the money to get the hell out of here, to create a better place to live, to pay a lawyer, to do fight the good fight, to get whatever for my kids or help whomever, People will say, if I'd had the money, I would have left, even though I know it's going to be a nightmare and all of that. But for many people, that's where they're stuck. And the narcissistic person kind of set it up that way. So, um, and and the narciss the money can also make the narcissistic person's mood moods waver. But financial and economic abuse, I have to say, it is in some way, shape, or form, it's been a, a a, an aspect of every narcissistic relationship I have ever witnessed. I mean, more money, more problems, but also more different ways to abuse people around that money. And when people have a lot of money and there's a narcissistic divorce, it gets ugly with legal fees that go into sometimes into the millions, which is just such a ridiculous waste of money. So there's that. Somebody asked about this yesterday, asked for it to be on yesterday's and I'm getting into it today, which is the narcissistic therapist. Okay. The narcissistic therapist is, it's a, it's a it, it, does it happen? Absolutely. There's no test we ever have to take that determines our mental health and our um, personality style. There's just not. And I do I have I met some narcissistic therapists? You absolutely better believe it. Because in its fashion, even though we view it as sort of a warm and fuzzy profession, a therapist could actually be a person who wields a lot of power. You're people are coming to you in a position of tremendous vulnerability and trust. You're you you're in a in a people don't always know how therapy works. A therapist could literally be telling a person to do something just to give you some of the parameters on how therapy works. For example, it's against the law. Against not not like an unethical. It's against the law for a person to have sex with a therapy patient against the law. Like it is, you will go to jail kind of thing as you should. And for much longer than I think they actually make people go to jail. You lose your license to practice. It's it's a whole it's a whole thing as it should. And in fact, if a, if a client was seeing me and they said they they they, um, they had had therapists, like they were, they were coerced because it's, it, it's never gonna be consensual with the therapist. Therapist has too much power. So that they had therapy, except with therapists, I by law have to do a whole process of giving them certain brochures and links and all of that. So it's even a procedure we have to follow if a, a patient tells us that this happened to them. Now you can easily see though how, because it, it happens all the time. I mean, I, I see the discipline reports. It happens all the time. So somebody thinks they're bigger than the rules. Somebody thinks that the rules don't um, apply to them. So the reason therapy works is it's governed by all of these structures and rules and all of that. So entitlement would mean these aren't my rules. I can do what I want. I can bill the way I want. I can bill insurance the way I want. I can charge an extortionate fee. I can... Um, I can break confidentiality. I can, well, any of the things that somebody might do who's behaving unethically, an unethical behavior often goes alongside narcissism. So there definitely are. Now, it sometimes may not show up, though, as these massive ethical breaches, like, you know, inappropriate sexual contact or something like that. It may show up as a therapist who shames you, who feels like they're judging you, who might be jealous or competitive with you. I've consulted on cases like that where the therapist almost was Again, the only thing, word I could use is felt jealous and competitive. And it almost felt as though that the therapy was, the therapy was getting sort of sabotaged in that way. That's something called countertransference. If we really are scared of a patient or don't like a patient, we have an ethical duty to refer that client out. So because we're going to harm them if we, we don't, if we don't feel like we can do good work with them. So narcissistic therapists can be, can be harmful. We certainly can make careful self-disclosures in therapy, but we're not supposed to say, okay, sit there. I'm going to tell you my life story and see what you learn from it. That's not how it works. And that might happen when, when the therapist is more sort of in the, in, in the sort of the narcissistic spectrum. So does it happen? Yes. Can it be harmful? Yes. Can it also just be something where you're like, I don't feel seen or heard here. Yeah. And I'll always say to folks, narcissistic therapists, notwithstanding, just take that piece out. 
If you're in therapy and it doesn't feel like sort of right in your body, right in your bones, then don't, no, you, you can give yourself permission to find a therapist with whom you did. I always tell people when I was a grad school a bazillion years ago and I was trying to find a therapist and some therapists, and I did this in my practice too, like you see graduate students and medical students for low cost sort of as a courtesy. And I interviewed three therapists. I met with three therapists and I paid them some nominal fee to do that. And I chose one of them. And I'm so glad I did that because with two of them, I didn't quite feel right. With the third, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so safe. So I think that, that you, paying attention to that sense of safety is important. Someone asked about addiction and narcissism. It's funny you asked this because all day today, I was actually, as I was going to these lectures, sometimes I was kind of playing, like looking at my laptop and editing a slide deck on addiction and narcissism, they're highly overlapping. So there's almost 60% of the time we see like an addiction co-occurring with narcissism, very, very common co-occurrence. I'm sure some of you have heard the term dry drunk and the dry drunk is somebody who's sober, but still engaging in all sort of the addict behaviors, lying, denial, deceit, hiding, um, uh, all, all, all the things, right, that we see in, in, in an addict's behavior, but they're sober. They're not, they're not using, they're not drinking. If you really dig into sort of at least a 12-step approach, because that terminology dry drunk comes out of sort of 12-step lore, the 12-step, you know, um, models, that what we see, and if you look at sort of step six, when we're talking about character defects, all of those character defects that are listed, that would be sort of what we consider the dry drunk to be. In fact, you know what? I, I have that I have that deck open right here. So I'm gonna even read to you what some of these look like. Let's see if I could find, here it is. So just look at this, here it is. So these are the kinds of things, like step six is the willingness to address um, character defects, anger, selfishness, dishonesty, jealousy, being overly critical, too much pride, arrogance, preoccupation with physical appearance, antagonistic, blaming self and others, closed-mindedness, codependence, overly critical, being controlling of others, impatience, intolerance, judgmentalness, irresponsibility, being neglectful of personal obligations and responsibilities, perfectionism, resentment, engaging in self-pity and self victimization, self-loathing, defensiveness, being dishonest and lying regularly. What does that sound like? It sounds like vulnerable narcissism. And so the, the concept of the dry drunk is very much someone who probably had both, got the sobriety going, going to meetings, focused on it. Sometimes it almost becomes a source of validation to stay sober. And anyone in addiction medicine say, we're going to work with what we got. We want this person to stay sober. But when that step six, those character defects don't shift, that's the narcissism remaining when the sobriety is in place. So many times a family will say, this person is sober. We know they are, but everything's as bad as ever with them. It's because that piece hasn't been addressed. And that's the hard piece. And that's even a piece that rehab centers aren't set up. You're not going to knock that out in 28 days. So there's a lot of overlap. It can complicate addiction treatment. And as long as somebody's in that sort of dry drunk place, stressors, frustrations, disappointments all become huge threats to relapse. And so those of you who are wondering what's the overlap, the overlap is huge. And you might say, it's funny you say that because um, I know someone who is a parent who's an alcoholic and it feels like the things they say are exactly the things I say, having a parent as a narcissist. It's very similar. It's very, very similar. And so as a result, I've even known some folks who said, you know, as, as not having access to therapy, they went to Al-Anon meetings, even though their parent wasn't a, um, a, a substance user or an alcoholic, but they found that the struck, some of the stuff that was being discussed by other people was resonant. It may not be the case for everyone. There's so much more I can say about that, but those are some of the top notes. Any of you who are seeing that association, it's been backed up by the research. Um, that, oh, I knocked up all the topics I was supposed to get to yesterday. Um, so let's now talk about, um, word. someone asked about word salad. Ha, ah, word salad, right? There's a lot of saying something and saying nothing. Like it'll be grandiose pronouncements. It'll be um, a person trying to describe a narcissistic person not having the answer, but trying to pretend like they have the answer. And then giving you this long meandering something or other. You're like, what are you saying? And when you say, what are you saying? And you seem confused. 
there's a pretty good probability that they're engaging in word salad. Word salad is probably part of the whole gaslighting complex of behaviors because it confuses and sometimes destabilizes someone. More it confuses you. Word salad can also like, you're like, okay, this person sent me this email or they said these things to me. I think they said something to me. And then you might think about it later. I, I had a word salad moment yesterday. And then I sat down again. I'm like, what did this person actually say to me? And then it dawned on me that this was word salad. Nothing was really said to me, but they felt better and they felt that they did their job. So that's also something we'll see as well. But it is really designed to kind of it, it's not that the narcissistic person says, I'm going to do word salad and confuse someone. They always feel like they, they, they feel like they can get one over. They, they don't have, they, they're going to find a way to answer the question so they don't look bad. But the way they do it, even how they deflect, it might even be, they'll deflect, you'll be asking them, why'd you get home late? And then they'll say, I wasn't home late. Why do you tell me I'm always home late? And you talk about late and I'm not late, but you know what you are? You're, you're late. You're late to the party. You're late to knowing who I am. You're And you're like, what are you talking about? So they'll pick up on a thread, but then they're accusing you of something and then they're using your language and you just, you're like, what? And so it's a lot of that. If you find yourself saying, what? You're, that's probably word salad, but it's really just sort of a, I put it, it's a, it's a, it's them attempting to respond when they don't have an answer and then just using lots of words and you're just confused. Um, someone also asked about, um, about post-separation abuse. Okay. That, that um, this kind of links to that, that the line in we had about the uh, coercive control and the financial abuse. Does every narcissistic relationship when it ends, and, what, and I mean any, like a family relationship. For example, you decide I'm not going to talk to my sister anymore sort of thing. Does every relationship, narcissistic relationship that ends, end up in post-separation abuse? Not necessarily. Some of it has to do with who does the ending. If you end the relationship and they don't want it to be ended, plan on post-separation abuse. If there is a, um, if it's going to look bad, make them look bad in public, even if they want out, plan on post-separation abuse. Um, if they, if it feels like a loss of power, somehow they're trying to regain power, plan on post-separation abuse. It tends to happen less when they're moving into their own new supply. So this would be someone who's been cheating on you and leaves you for the new person, right? So they, they've got their own sort of thing going on, probably less so. However, if that whole movement of them leaving, cheating on you and going into a new relationship is now going to culminate in a divorce. And I've yet to see the narcissistic divorce that goes smoothly. You're going to ask for what you're in, what, what you have the right to. And you may very well want, you know, a different custody agreement than they want. Then you can see post-separation abuse, right? So it's, it is post-separation abuse is a combination of them showing, attempting to still show power and control it is a punishment for you making them feel bad. It is a lashing out because they might've felt abandoned, but it's, it, it's a combination of a punishment meets vindictiveness meets revenge meets I'm going to take my power back. And it can look like, and again, it's on a continuum at the mildest ends of, of post-separation abuse is passive aggressive, pathetic little Facebook um, little or Instagram posts. Like, you know, things like, some meme image, like when the person who promised that they would love you forever, blah, 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 some kind of something like that. You might get some of that and it keeps happening over and over again. Maybe the rogue DM, the annoying text, that kind of thing. As you go all the way to the other extreme of the post-separation abuse continuum, you might see stalking, threats, surveillance, um, showing up where you work, uh, that kind of thing, you know, th th that would be the extreme. And in the middle are those long meandering emails, flying monkeys, smear campaigns, um, reputational harm. They may call your employer. Um, they may try to harm your employment status. So I've seen some people be sued um, because you kept seven of their picture frames, whatever it may be. So that, that there's a whole range of things that can happen. How it ends, it depends on how severe it is. When it gets very, very severe, 
more severe things might be brought to place like you know uh, protective orders or restraining orders which are not easy to get which might inflame them further at the milder end it tends to run its course you block them you you know you might go off social media for a while and it might just sort of they'll they'll get engaged with something else but it's very real and it's actually unsettling enough that it's enough to keep some people in these relationships saying I know what it's like if I stay. I have no idea what this is going to like if look like if I go, and I don't know that I have the bandwidth for it. Um, some, and then this relates to the next question of which are what the, these idea of power dynamics and narcissistic relationships. That's an easy one to answer. They're asymmetric. Because Dr. Jennifer Fried used that term with me once, and it stayed with me. They're asymmetric. A narcissistic person can never be in a relationship where power is balanced. There always will have to be an asymmetry, no matter what. They have to know more, they have to be more, they have to be recognized more. That's how it works. So any attempts by you to make some form of equivalence is always going to be met with, with some form of pushback. Even if it's the kind of thing where you make more money, let's say you have a job and over time you make more money, but it's going to be very, very difficult for them. And they're either going to get in digs or going to get passive aggressive stuff. They may say, well, why should I bother working anymore? So they may not contribute as much. They may act out in any number of ways to get that power sense sort of back. So the, it's, it's again, there's always imbalance. There's no version of it where it's going to be on the same, the same level. Another great question we got was, what about if you're the only child of narcissistic parents? Okay. It, the, it, this is a tough one because you it, it's a mixed bag. What happens is one would ask, well, what role does that only child have? Depends. They could end up being a golden child. They could also be a scapegoat. That child may also take multiple roles. They may be a golden child fixer or a scapegoat truth seer. It really depends on aspects of the child, of the parents, the nature of that family system. So th that can happen. Now, it could also be that if a person has one narcissistic parent, one not, and they, they're an only child and that not narcissistic parent is healthy enough, the child will be able to make a good alliance with them. But it can feel, I mean, it may feel lonely, but there's also less of a likelihood of that triangulation within the system. So there is that piece, that, that piece gets lifted of this, the, the narcissistic parents sort of, sort of turning the, the siblings every which way around. There's no one to be compared against. But if things are odd there, there may be no one to share it with either. I just think that that only child is going to have more roles heaped on them. And if they don't perform the way that parent has, they don't have another place to turn to. Like, so if you, they only are interested, for example, in a child who's going to be an athlete, or they only wanted a boy and it's a girl child, whatever it may be, then that narcissistic parent may totally clock out. That might be what happens because the, the kid's not what they want. And the narcissistic parent could literally see like, this is what I want. And so that they simply won't be, um, they won't be engaged. Someone also asked about, well, I'm going to answer one more of these questions. Don't worry. I'm going to get to, um, I'm going to get to this INFJ and I'm also, we're going to get to the questions. What about narcissistic best friends? One would say, how did you, how would you get into that easily? I think friends are funny relationships. They evolve just like any other relationship. And we're, I think we're more nostalgic about friendships. And it's because they don't have the pressures of monogamy and all of that. We tend to hold on to them for longer. So this, this concept of, of narcissistic best friends happens. You say, well, why don't you just kick the friend to the curb? Why? Because there might be shared history. There, um, there may be a, a, like all the trauma. We can be trauma bonded to a friend. Make no mistake about that. We might um, feel bad for them. We might feel like we need them. We might feel isolated and lonely without them. And they can do the same number on us, the manipulation. They could be financially abusive. They could be competitive. Um, they could gossip about us. Like there's all sorts of things. So it's all the dynamics. And I think a best friend, that because it's often a very close friend, can actually have a lot of the parallel dynamics that you'd see in a narcissistic intimate relationship. And as a result, have the same fallout. Any of you who have been hurt by a narcissistic friend will, will recall that as it was happening or it's happening now, you ruminated, you couldn't get it out of your head, you couldn't believe it, like, how did I misjudge this? Or that we've gone through a lot together or whatever it may be, you may really be quite gobsmacked when this happens with a friend and not be, um, and be every bit as hurt and destabilized and everything. And I'll tell you this, I think we're less likely to spot narcissism in a friend because it doesn't have the same kind of heaviness 
as a relationship, things like betrayal and things like that take on a different meaning in a friendship. So it may take us years before we figure it out in a friend. And then something will happen. We're like, how did I not see this sooner? And then the story makes sense backwards. So to my INFJ person, because I don't, I promise I'd answer it. Let me find this message because I'm hoping it's not too hidden here. Let me see if I can find this. I hid it this, with this particular text. I was having many communications. So um, here we go. Found it. Okay. These are some of the thoughts on the INFJ, which is interesting. INFJs are have very high empathy, are very sensitive, like in the sense of like not sensitive, like they're reactive, but like just sensitive, like almost like a highly sensitive person. They often have a strong sense of purpose. They're often very altruistic. So they give of themselves and don't expect anything back and may also be very private people, have strong beliefs and values. There's a lot of care with integrity. So it could very well be that the INFJs, and this is, you know, Irene's idea, which is I, I, I really agree with, that all of these qualities might mean that the, an INFJ would be much more likely to stick it out in a narcissistic relationship and sort of do the right thing, as it were, probably make a lot of excuses, give tons of second chances. One of the key characteristics that she listed about the INFJ is that they sometimes feel different or even weird as though they wouldn't fit in with other people. So that might be that when they finally meet someone, including a narcissistic person, they may stick it out because they don't necessarily always feel that they're going to fit in with someone else. But INFJs also value deep, authentic relationships. Um, but I would say that given all the things that the, all the, the high, the high empathy, the willingness to make excuses, despite wanting that might be in more of a trap to make excuses for the behavior. And so it's, again, that's, that's probably how that INFJ thing is playing out. So all of that said, let's go to your question. Sorry. So many things to get through as topics, but again, we have any questions here. Narcissists and death. How do narcissistic people feel about death? They don't like it. And I'm not sure that anybody's saying they like it, but I think a lot of us learn that it's just simply the universal part of our lives or it's part of the human experience. I mean, we're seeing it now. There's more and more people who seem to think they're going to be able to outwit death or live to be 250 if they eat the right things or take the right supplements. So I have to wonder what that's about. That feels a bit grandiose. I think in the annals of history, there have always been people who thought you could drink this, do this, and you would live many, many, like much longer than a human being could ever live. They don't like it. And it's a, um, it's a real challenge to them because it's the, it, it, number one, it makes them like everybody else. But number two, it's, it's, there's a, there's an anxiety to narcissism that a not knowing and, but there, it really rattles them. And I'd say it's, it's a destabilizing destabilizing feeling for narcissistic folks. And I think if they're grappling with it, it would be a struggle, especially if it's younger than what would be expected for them. I think as they get older, we might even see some of an irritability kicking in at just getting older. Um, but no, they, I think they, if here's what I say, nobody likes it. I think they like it. And I shouldn't say nobody. I think in some cultures, there's a schema around death where there's a very strong acceptance of it as a natural stage of life. So I can't say nobody likes it. I think there's certain folks in the world who just simply accepted it as part of the cycle of, of, of living and, and as important a cycle as any other. Um, but how do they feel about it? I think if I were to hazard a guess, far, far less. They, they struggle with it more because that idea of mortality flies in the face of grandiosity. Um, other questions? How does a 66-year-old woman who had a narcissistic father that has been gone for 25 years stop the ruminating tapes of her childhood? So I don't know if that gone has only been like, so the woman's 66, which would mean if the father, I don't know if he died or left or whatever. So um, since she, the woman was 41, I guess, or did he go when she was a child? That piece, I don't know. So how do we stop the ruminating tapes of childhood? I would say a couple of things. If the ruminating voices of childhood are that preoccupying i do think trauma-informed therapy becomes an absolutely essential first step because it is a in a way that this digging into that whether it's something like emdr or something like that getting into that trauma is going to become absolutely crucial even if it's and beyond trauma-informed therapy is also talking about this relationship from a place of how you felt about it and what happened and getting validation about that in an objective space. 
that is going to be a requirement when the rumination is this um, is this sort of pronounced. Even something like internal family systems work, where you sort of are understanding on how all these parts of you are working together, that might even help get to some of this. So that's so there's one piece of it is that how how do you and I and how do you slow it? I think setting the goal of stopping it might feel like a high goal because those tapes are good. Those ruminating sort of tapes, as it were, are going to come back at certain times when something is reminiscent of that situation, when certain anxieties come up. So what you're trying to do really is keep this at bay. So you are getting through your life, not in a dissociated way, but you are getting through life and there's going to be times something will come up and some of that rumination may come back, but you feel like you have the tools to manage it. Right. So I think that the, um, that I mean, age doesn't matter here. It doesn't matter if you're 66 or 26. That this, these, these, these ruminating voices are unsettling and distressing and uncomfortable, and that they can be worked on. And as we said, rumination is when when it's functional rumination, as it were. It may actually get us to a solution, right? That we we ruminate about something. We're like, oh, I've got it. I've got it figured out. And then we do the figuring out. But when it's not functional rumination, as it's often not when we're managing a narcissistic relationship, you keep ruminating and ruminating and ruminating, you don't get to a solution, and that ends up in self-blame because it's there's no thinking through it. And not knowing what the nature of the ruminations is, this is a little trickier for me to answer, but things like talking about it, I mean, yes, a lot of the stuff out there on rumination talks about distraction. It's only going to work so long because there's a core well, there's an origin here that this is coming from that needs to be explored more on why even after 25 years of this person's absence that these tapes are, are playing. I would actually say internal family systems could be really, really useful work here because there's some sort of family dynamic issues. When I say family within you, not like mother, father, that kind of thing. I mean, within you to work out like what what voices are staying and how why are they so persistent and how to make sense of them. That EMDR, those would be great places to start. But I would say, given how long this person's gone and yet these things are so still so preoccupying, it would require that kind of an approach. Any other questions? What do you tell someone who has empathy ugh, and thinks they can help their narcissistic partner? Okay, this is, yeah, this is a tough one. Um, I think you want to be careful to not be heavy handed and say, you can't help them, let it go. It's, it feels in a way what that would do, it, it will, they'll almost want to double down on trying to help the narcissistic partner and sort of, um, and even might distance themselves from you, who is a, who is someone supportive. If this is someone you're close to, and you're often having to hear this conversation again and again, you absolutely can start piling up the data in your mind and saying, I you're such a good, you're a kind, loving person. I fully understand why you want to be there and support and help. I get this, and I, I, I know you believe in they're going to change. However, we've been talking about this for fill in the blank, how many months, years, whatever. And none of this has actually caused much change. I'm worrying about you because it's looking at all these things you do. They're not causing change and they're all good things. So I'm wondering how much of this is them. So you're just sort of making it more into a rhetorical conversation rather than they're not going to change. And so you're not putting them on the defensive and you're saying you had told me about when this da 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 and that didn't work and da 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 that didn't work. And then empathize with them and say, I'm so sorry because your friend with empathy probably isn't getting any from this relationship. And I'm so sorry because you I know how much you've tried and I know how much you want it to be better. And it's really hard to accept when we can't do that. You can take things more into collective language, not make it only about this person so it doesn't bring up a sense of shame in them, but approach with the gentleness, but don't be shy about saying, hey, you've been to this rodeo before with this person. So this, this pattern is consistent and I'm starting to worry about you because you're really wearing yourself out. Keep your, your concern on them and then put in that sprinkle of, because yeah, I'm not seeing that this is working and it's not because you're not trying. Let them know, I see that you're trying. I just don't know that, they, that they're gonna come around the way you're hoping. That's very different than you can't help them, 
and um, and be gentle. And they're going to get there on their own time. And it's going to be frustrating because you'll think you could have gotten this already. They're going to get it when they get it, just like we all did. We all got there when we got there and we got there when it was our time to get there. And yes, some of us would say, I wish I got it sooner. We got it when we got it. And the lesson was ready for us to be to be held by us. And we've held on to it. So just to be a, to be a supporter, but also give me honest with you, you got to support you because there's only so many times you're going to be able to hear this friend's story without you feeling some level of compassion fatigue. So whatever support you need to get for you to, you know, and take care of you, that's also going to be important. Other questions. So what happens when a narcissistic person doesn't have supply, particularly as they become elderly? It's a very, very good question. It's not good. The best analogy I can give you is I want you to imagine a balloon that's full of air, like big balloon, like big, red, shiny balloon. And then I want you to imagine how that balloon starts to look as the air comes out of it. And it starts getting a little bit droopy and floppy and it doesn't look so shiny. It just has that flat rubber look. And then when all the air goes out of it, it's just a blah, flat, floppy piece of plastic or rubber on the counter, right? That's pretty much what it looks like. When a narcissistic person has supply, they're the big, red, shiny balloon. As they lose supply, it's a lot more floppy, and then there's nothing. It, it is, and it's whatever, what does that floppiness look like psychologically? In some cases, they may become more irritable. They may become more victimized. They themselves may become more isolated. In more extreme cases, they may become paranoid, suspicious of the world, lock themselves off from the world, not always accept help. Some of it's going to come down to the type of narcissism. A vulnerable narcissist is more likely to do what I just described. A grandiose narcissistic person, they're so extroverted that they'll probably keep themselves or see them around other people, but they'll either keep looking for new people or have a couple of people who are willing to hang around. Um, but as that goes on, we definitely see what I can only call a deflation. It's and, and it is a, because they haven't learned how to maintain long-term relationships in that deep, consistent way, which we know is such an important thing to have as you grow older in terms of health. This is actually why in some ways, because women are often socialized to maintain more long-term social contact, long-term aging often looks better in women because they're better at maintaining those long-term ties. A man who does that will have a very similar protection. It's just more of what women sort of are, so they do tend to do it more naturally. But because narcissistic people have often burned bridges with ex-spouses or spouses have passed away with their own children, nobody wants to help them. They're not fun to help. And so they might find themselves in the position where they need help. At best, they're getting perfunctory help. So that that's what happens is in some cases, like I said, very irritable, some cases very isolated and almost paranoid. And, um, and I do think that it actually speeds up their demise because they're not getting help. They may not be watching what they're eating. There, there may not be eyes on, on them in terms of health. Um, yeah, people just aren't interested in them anymore. They, and and the one exception to this, I am going to say though, are sometimes very wealthy narcissistic people. I mean, not like billionaires, but like enough money that they can pay to keep people around. So, it might be a family that has, I don't know, like a, a house someplace that like a beach or a lake or something like that. So they might be able to keep people around because of the money by offering money. They can pay caregivers, but that's very different. I mean, I'm not so sure that that's supply. Supply is usually attention, praise, that, that, that sort of thing. And then as we get older, I mean, all the things that happen when we get older, right? We don't look the way we once did. Our minds may not be as sharp. A person may not be working and getting supply that way. So there's also more of a deflation. And because narcissistic people do struggle with the whole meaning and purpose piece of it, which is so important as we go into later life, that piece may also be missing for them too, is that they don't have that meaning pur purpose kind of piece. Um, there for them, and they're not really interested in it either. There hasn't been a lot of introspection in their life. So it's it, it's not pretty. That's the short answer to your question. Um, other questions. Can you talk about narcissistic splitting? Yeah. So splitting is a dynamic that we witness in, in a variety of antagonistic personality styles, not just narcissism, but even styles like borderline styles. And so by nature, these kinds of personality styles they don't do well with shades of gray. There's black and white. You're good, you're bad. So if you, let's start with you are in a relationship with a narcissistic person. And there are going to be days where you hung the moon. You're the 
best. I'm so lucky. Like you'll actually get all this kind of love bomby seeming praise, or even the whole love bomb phase is going to be this whole idealized phase. And when you ain't good, you're bad. There's no sense of like, all of us are gray, right? Like, love you. Today, you're pissing me off, right? That kind of thing. And thanks so much for doing that. Like, you are pissing me off, but I love you and I like you. Like, we come into that gray with the people we care about. Mm -mm. On the day, either they just had a bad day or you didn't do or say exactly what they want, you're bad. Like, you go from good to bad. So that splitting really does speak to what's considered sort of what's happening. It is an internal process for them. It's often often considered a projection of the internal process they have. Because if you think of what a narcissistic person really does internally, there's this bad, shamed internal part of them. And on top of that, they maintain this idealized perfect, perfect part of them, black and white, dark and light, good and bad. That's inside them. Well, they do that to everyone around them too. So that's one form of it. Now, the other way that this can look involves multiple people. And it's as though in the narcissistic person's world, some people have to be good and some people have to be bad. Like everyone almost has these roles. It's like uh, checkers on a board, like some are red and some are black, right? And so people are put in those roles. And you might even have, some of you might have had this experience in a workplace. You might look at each other and say, who's going to be the bad one today? If you grew up in a narcissistic family, you might even see a narcissistic parent engage in that kind of splitting. Someone's good, someone's bad, and those roles may change depending on how you are in the narcissistic person's life in terms of are you showing up with what they need? Are you the thing that they're feeling good with at that point? That's what that splitting is. But what it does is it creates a confusion if you don't know what you're dealing with, right? That if you know what you're dealing with, you're like, here we go. Here goes the splitting. And you know that you're not good or bad, that you're just you. And that you're almost like this object that they're projecting their stuff onto. That's not a healthy adult relationship. A healthy adult relationship is that two people in a relationship see each other wholly, good and bad, can maintain a consistent schema of the other person. We may be mad at someone, but it doesn't mean we stop loving them, right? We may be happy with someone and they may make a mistake and we still might get perturbed, right? That can all be tolerated. But when you go from being great at breakfast and you are the worst person at three o'clock, it should go right to your head that you, that's splitting. This is an internal thing that's happening to them. It's a, it's frustrating because you're still you and it's, it's you know, being viewed as something we're not is is frustrating and confusing and all of that. But that's that's how that, and it's all, it's all really a deep psychodynamics sort of experience that they're having that often goes back to early childhood sorts of developmental kinds of um, processes in their own personality and intrapsychic structures that never got to fully develop. And so we're still sort of seeing, when you go all the way back, if we look at psychoanalytic models, it's believed <clears throat> that the baby experiences the parent as two, the care, primary caregivers, two different people, the good and the bad, and there are two people. There's a person who shows up and feeds me, and then there's a person who ain't coming. And those are two people. Healthy human be behavior is the integration of that caregiver into one human being that even if she doesn't show up right away, all right, I can talk myself through it, or I can learn language to call that caregiver towards me. That's normal development, which is really telling us that people with antagonistic personalities at some level are kind of stuck at an infantile stage of development. Any others? Can the effects on the brain from drugs be mistaken as narcissism? Yes, it can. So where are we gonna see this most pronounced in a most pronounced way? Stimulants. So stimulants create grandiosity. That high, right, is it, look, it looks grandiosity, euphoria, looks like a narcissistic person on a really good day. And in fact, narcissistic people are often very naturally drawn to stimulant drugs for exactly that reason. It's almost like taking that grandiosity and almost creating more of it. So when a person takes a stimulant drug, cocaine's a great example, they feel invincible. So it's a very much a drug of choice for people with this personality. But if for some reason, the first 10 times you met someone, they were on cocaine, you would well be well within your rights to think they're narcissistic, right? The first 10 times you met someone who's on cocaine, they also likely also may be struggling with addiction. But if that's the only time you've seen someone when they're high on cocaine, you absolutely would think they were narcissistic. But if maybe you saw them on, I don't know, 
over a one year period, you saw them on these weird weekends. And that's that that absolutely could be mistaken as narcissism. But here's why it shouldn't be mistaken as narcissism, because you're also going to see this person come down, assuming you spend time with them other than when they're acutely intoxicated, that if you saw them at other times, you would see some form of the rest of their personality. And if they were a non-narcissistic person who just happened to be using cocaine, they ain't going to be that pretty during the crash. But once they come out of it, they're just going to show up as a non-entitled human being who's just living their life. Maybe they were just partying one weekend and that's what they did. But by and large, it's not what they usually do. So it definitely can be. Now, in the long term, and maybe that's what you mean by your question, if a person uses drugs for long enough, could that click them into a narcissistic personality? Probably not, because to the degree the intoxicated state is what creates it looking like narcissism. Yes. Now, I was talking earlier about addiction and narcissism. It's the the behaviors of the addicted person, rationalization, justification, denial, sometimes shame, emotions that they're struggling to regulate. So they'll use drugs and alcohol to regulate that. Some of those dynamics can look like narcissism. The selfishness of the addict. I'm going to get this, this, this money for these drugs because there's such a physiological pull. I've got to get the drugs to survive. Nobody looks good when they're surviving. And so the, the, the addict might take money from family members, might take advantage of family members who are letting them live with them. That shows a lack of empathy. That shows an entitlement. I, one could even say an arrogance, right? So those dynamics will look like narcissism when a person's in, in the um, active addiction because they have no regard for anybody else. They care only, only, only about getting drugs and alcohol. There are people, though, who are addicts will say, I really love my kids. And but at the point they were actively addicts, but I loved drugs and alcohol more at that at that time. But there would be moments, you know, they would be their kids. They'd be engaged with their kids. They'd be loving and in, in, enjoying their kids. But when their when their brain was screaming for drugs, that would take precedence over their kids. So I don't know if you mean the literal acute intoxication piece, which is what I was just sharing, or if you mean the long-term effects of drugs on alcohol. Now, if a person uses drugs for a long time, they don't have a narcissistic personality, they get treated for addiction, they commit to sobriety, their baseline personality will still be there. And so it will not, I don't, addiction won't turn someone narcissistic. That narcissistic personality had developed during childhood. And it's not unusual for kids who are coming up and developing a narcissistic personality. What all the stuff that goes along with, in some ways, creating a narcissist or similar to an addict, childhood adversity, difficulties with regulation, externalizing temperaments, um, the, the sort of the acting out that we sometimes might even see in things like ADHD, chaotic family environments. Those are all things that put a person at risk for initiating substance use in their teens and also things that put a person at risk for potentially developing a narcissistic personality in adulthood. So there's a lot of overlap, but I don't think we'd ever say that the use of drugs and alcohol caused narcissism in the long term. So I hope that answers that question. In this one, uh, this question is, how does intergenerational trauma coincide with narcissistic abuse? I have seen a pattern with the women in my family. It absolutely coincides because this does tend to run in families, right? Especially if there's multiple siblings. And so in trauma, it's someone's going to break that cycle in a family, right? Even if it's only for one arm. So one sibling in a family breaks out of the cycle, has their own family, and, and, and they're great with their kids, and there's a healthy healthy attachments, and they have a healthy marriage. And in that arm of the family, it ends, but there could be other siblings who recreate the family of origin. Thus, it remains intergenerational. But with narcissistic abuse, again, keeping in mind that if you have a parent, so in other words, a parent, let's say you have a child who has the temperament to develop narcissism, and they grow up in a, in a home with an abusive parent. Because now you have that environmental invalidation, the likelihood against that biological vulnerability, again, the likelihood of creating more narcissism will is, is likely to happen. So the um, some of the patterns we see in intergenerational trauma, the invalidation, the shaming, the uh, betrayal, 
all of those are linked in to what we also see in narcissistic abuse. So it very much coincides. These are very much intergenerational cycles. That's why it's important for us to have these conversations because otherwise people are much more likely to create a cycle where they may replicate this even unwittingly, even though you're not narcissistic, you may get into a relationship with someone narcissistic, have kids with them, and now that child is being exposed to a narcissistic parent. And in your case, you're seeing, it sounds like you're seeing a pattern with your mother, then your sister, and even a niece, which would be then your niece's, your, your sister, I'm assuming your sister's daughter. It, uh, yes, definitely, because this does run in families, and, it, and the family systems can beget it, and it can be kept in place. And and it's tragic to watch because the question is going to be whether your niece is going to be the one to end the cycle. And that might be things like your niece being in therapy, but that's going to be hard because her mom may not allow it. And and that's where you start to see how no one can kind of get in there and sort of stop it because they're almost all reinforcing each other. We're right and others in the family are wrong. They're the ones who are a problem. We're good. And you can see how that they can stop any form of growth from happening. So yes, very much linked. Why don't we do one more question? After coming from a narcissistic family and going straight into a narcissistic marriage, what are the steps to finding yourself? Well, first, the fact that you're recognizing all this is honestly nothing short of miraculous. That's absolutely amazing. It's not easy, especially if you went from one system into another. The second is what I've always described in these lives and in other things I do is sort of a dis kind of clearing the tentacles off of the net, as it were, right? Like just kind of understanding it's it's looking at all the cycles in your family like who were the narcissists start, let's start here who were the narcissistic people in your family of origin was it one parent both parents grandparents aunts uncles siblings draw it out on a piece of paper and draw lines to you and make notes on what those effects were you can say, okay, in this case, with I'm, I'm making it up because I don't know your story. Um, maybe you have a narcissistic mom. And you can say body image stuff. Um, always feeling like I'm saying something foolish. Feeling like I'm selfish. Then you might have on there like a narcissistic sibling. And you're going to draw arrows. I say feeling very competitive. Feeling as though I should never question. Well, however it looks in your family. Drawing all that out reflecting on the effects for you, and then doing something similar with your marriage. How did that affect you? How much of it was a magnification of what you had in your family of origin? And how much of it was something new? Now you know what you're kind of up against. Then the steps to finding yourself, as we know, good old radical acceptance, which it sounds like you're getting there. If you're already able to see this, it's not going to change. It's, this is not something you did. It still hurts. Um, but their, and their behavior was unacceptable the period of grief, which you may or may not have gone through. And then after that, it is asking yourself, and again, if you have the book, I actually lay this out in the section of the book, like the questions to ask yourself. And this is also mirrored in that reading guide that any of you, by the way, any of you who are here who want the reading guide, it's available to any of you who, who are, you know, who've gotten the book, um, is ask yourself questions. What matters to me? I really want you to grapple with it. What matters to you? What are your values? Um, what do you stand for? What do you like? You know, and there's there's books out there, and I don't mean this to sound farcical, but there's literally books out there like for people to get to know someone else. I can't think even the New York Times has like this this test you're supposed to ask someone else these questions. I sat with it once and I asked myself the questions, right? You're supposed to do it with someone else. I didn't. I did it with me. It's like 40 questions to ask someone you're getting into a relationship. I'm like, how much do I know myself? Start asking yourself those questions. Because even that stuff, which is actually kind of superficial, becomes a place to begin. Then it becomes about intuitions. What do you, like, what do you intuit? Like, when do you feel comfortable, uncomfortable? How is that held in your body? And how do you respond to that? Journaling is huge. Because on a given day, you might say, you know, today, I didn't feel comfortable about da-da-da. And I still did it. And I had a terrible time. Pay attention to, like, you might say, I didn't want to go to that party. I felt like I had to. I went. It was miserable. I wish I just stayed home. Then it might be another time when you say, hmm. I wasn't going to go on that business trip, but I'm so glad I did because I met all these cool people. Sort of see how that all works. It's as though you're collecting data on yourself 
and starting to integrate it. And even if you're still in this marriage, because I don't know if you are or you aren't, you can still do this. You're still sharing it with them. You know, you're not sharing it with them, but unearthing these, what is your personality? Even if, you know, listen, I'm not thrilled with the online personality test. I think sometimes think they're wacky, but take one, like some of the, it's called an ocean test. They call it, it's actually that five factor test I was talking about. What comes out there? Like, are you coming out as agreeable? Like take a, a values test, like so, things out there that, again, these are somewhat superficial, but they're sort of forcing you to kind of say, okay, now I know something. I know something about myself. Like it's a self-study. Those are some of the steps to finding yourself. Start engaging in activities that matter to you, whatever they may be. I'm not telling you to go write the great American novel. Do things that might feel like they matter to you. Take a class, um, or even an online one, if you're not able to get somewhere. Um, read books. D d expand yourself and figure out what you like and what you don't like. And as you accumulate that evidence and sort of see what happens when you're acting in line with what matters to you, you're going to start making connections and saying this works, this doesn't work. And really what's also important, even if it's a small one, two, three people, create some healthy social connections because it's those spaces that are going to be validating when you might say like, I like this. And I was like, great. Yeah, you're really good at it. And they'll, people will notice you in a healthy way, but it's not easy picking up these pieces when you're later in life, sometimes we feel a lot of shame if we're even in our 30s, 40s, 50s, and we're the, for the first time facing down issues that it feels like people would have done in their teens. Okay, so they did, and we're doing it later. But it's important you do it, and you can give yourself permission to do it. Again, view it as an excavation. You're digging out deeper and deeper layers. At the beginning, you're just sort of clearing some of the dust, and you're just going to keep. It's a very, very slow process. Little things. What do you like to eat? What kind of movies do you like? Just start to get, it's almost like you're dating yourself. Like, what do you want to know about yourself and start doing it? It's a slow process. And also, again, connecting this to trusting your body and how you feel things and how intuition guides you, all of that. I hope that's helpful, um, but it's a process. And again, do I do get into some of that in the book, but you can even try other things too, like get to know you kinds of activities. So this is the point in the evening when I say, are there any things you want me to cover tomorrow night? Because I still have some things left over, like self-victimization, narcissistic fleas. I didn't get to that. Um, uh, no contact. How do I stop having to spend all my time just coping with this relationship? Um, this is why I have bad writing. I can't. Cover-ups, narcissistic cover-ups. Are there any other topics you'd like me to cover tomorrow? Because we are doing one more. We're doing another one tomorrow. Ha, ha, ha. I love that. Whoever said that, you are my friend. Narcissism in academia. Love it. I can talk about that. Sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Smear by family. Got it. And that happens a lot. Got it. Narcissist versus psychopath. Safety plans. Okay. Any others? Okay. Well, I think we have enough here to work with. So thank you again so much. Like I said, you have till tomorrow at midnight if you want to order the book for the first time and get the retreat and enter into the raffle. If you're like, oh, I'd like one more raffle entry and I did want to buy someone a gift, this is the time to do it by midnight tomorrow in whatever time zone you're in. And above all else, whether you get it or not, I really want to say this is really, to me, this is this time with you is my thank you for supporting this, supporting this work. I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a place where I'm a room full of therapists, not right now, but downstairs. And I have to say that so many people are saying this work has really, really sort of percolated up. We can't ignore it anymore. This is also your responsiveness to supporting this work in all the ways you do. So thank you. It goes beyond you. And um, I'm grateful to be able to spend this time. So have a wonderful Friday night. Have a great start to your weekend. I'll see you for a little while tomorrow. Thank you again. Bye.